Yeah, this could be it. So without further ado, let's have a look at some bathymetry. That's the thing to do. So if I say I'm going to share a screen and we'll have a look at Google Earth, which is always somewhere different. Oh, there's Google Earth. Um, <clears throat> and once more, we're relying on the bathymetry that Rob Claxton did for us, which is very nice for of him. If I knock out the sidebar, um, then that's roughly the full frontage of Chroma. Um, and Chroma is kind of, well, sort of centered on its pier. And so you can see where the, the bathymetric boat had to skirt the pier. <laughs> And I mean, and to an extent, you can see where this shore is so shallow, sort of the limitations as to how far it got in. I think the boat that did the bathymetry was something like a 14 meter catamaran, so it could actually come in very shallow. Um, but to come in this close, it must have been high tide, it really would have been. I mean, you could have jumped out, you could mm. stand in it, but that's not a criticism. Um, compared with some of the sites. Um, Chroma's sort of not consistent. It sort of just fades from one thing into another thing across it. Um, it also doesn't have kind of the regular features we see on some of the sites where the, the chalk is extremely regular. Um, but th there's some of that. So what we're going to talk about is sort of the three aspects of Chroma that we've explored so far. And that's to say nothing of the further bits offshore that we have dived that well, would be another talk and are really boat related. So this is a, a shore focused dive guide. Over on the west is where it's easiest to dive. I think that's, that's fair, isn't it, Dawn? Mm -hmm. um, this is what they call the Western Promenade. Um, and as far as divers are concerned, easy is a relative term. I was just thinking that. Because it's another place with a massive reinforced frontage. So if we zoom in a bit, so gradually, so it's not too nauseating, um, <clears throat> you can probably see that this frontage is hard. And that's a, a retaining wall, which is probably in, by the pier it's probably more than 10 feet tall, hmm. three meters. Um, down here, you still can't really, you still wouldn't jump down I would not choose to jump. Unless no. you were young and springy mm. and stupid or drunk. Um, so probably still six or seven feet. And then behind that, there's what people in East Anglia would call a cliff. Um, but what people in, in other parts of the country call sort of a steep slope. And you can see this is one of the ways down, and this is the zigzag path. And you can probably see by the zigzag how steep it is. You don't do that for a laugh. And whereas at Overstrand, there's I mean, one zig and one zag. I think there's three in total. I think there's zigzag zig. <laughs> <laughs> because you go around two corners on the way up, don't you? I, th I think you're almost at the bottom at the way down on the way down. Mm. So anyway, the, look at look at it. It's, it's steep. massive. It's steep. Um, that one's the gentler one because it's a slope. And each of these weird things in the corner, I think, is a little shelter with a little seat. So you can sit down if you don't mind pushing an old lady off a seat. <laughs> um, you can have a sit down. Um, <laughs> if you if you fancy something more strenuous, there's the white steps. And I can understand that from this view, it looks like a cable car. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, ooh, let's see. Actually, it's a set of really nasty, <laughs> steep metal steps. Um, not nasty, I suppose, in the sense that it's quite broad. There's handrails right. both sides. Um, but every one of these white rectangles is a little landing where you have to sort of stop and go round something that is purely designed to obstruct you. 
Uh, presumably, it's to stop people falling all the way down. Yeah, falling all the way down <laughs> in one go, um, or particularly, I guess, letting go of a push chair and finding <laughs> a pile of people at the bottom. Either way, it's a bit of a nuisance. Yeah, it's about 110 altogether. Isn't yeah, 110 it? steps, I think, and it feels every one of them. Last year, you what, did you forget your mask or your hood? My hood. Um, and Dawn had got down to the beach. We were just having a bad tempered conversation already because walking down is miserable enough. Um, and Dawn said, no, actually I've got to go back up and, and had to go all the way up. And I watched you to the top to make sure you were right. <laughs> so you had passed out due to heat and you hadn't. Um, since they've refurbished the Western promenade, um, this area is actually chalk themed. There's some quite nice murals on it um, with chalky views, um, nice bright sandscapes and a little game you can play for looking at cuttlefish and flabellina nudibranchs. There's some information boards on the steps as well. Oh yes, yes we had something to do with information boards as well. But more important than that old junk which took <laughs> ages to settle um, there are now some quite nice showers and toilets. They are a huge improvement on the sort of ancient, smelly... Um, sort of, Hole in the ground. Yes, I mean more sort of trap that was over to this side. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, that's the, I suppose that's the layout. And I suppose you should say that the zigzag steps are close to the main Chroma car park. And there's, there's a cut through to the top of the cliffs. And so it's not illogical to park in the car park there. Although close is a bit of a misnomer. Yeah, it's still a bit of a walk, but a level walk. Our first choice is to find a car parking space on the main coast road just here. It's free there. And if you park around here, you can just zip through to the top of the white steps. Quick as you like. <laughs> Um, the, it's not usually unbelievably hazardous changing on the main road, um, just a bit exciting. Um, second best is parking in some of these back streets. Um, that's quite safe, although you get a better audience. Um, and then a bit more of a walk. The car park is okay if you've taken up the season ticket. Mm. You can do council season ticket parking for three months for £18? I think it was only 13 last year. It was surprisingly reasonable. Yeah, in the teens. But you need to get there very early to get a space near to that end. Otherwise, it's horrendous. Mm. Yeah, it can, can be absolutely horrendous. And one of the reasons we haven't dive, dived Chroma a lot is the lack of parking. Um, we'll mention that on the other sites as well. But let's, let's not dwell on it. Let's say that this is an interesting area. Um, compared with Sheringham and the Runtons, which are instantly picturesque, well, sort of, once you're 50 metres out, mm. there's sort of lush growth animals. This stuff looks brutalised. Um, it's an area of, I guess, heavily abraded low chalk and flints and massive boulders by East Anglian standards. Mm. So... Yeah, proper sort of suitcase sized metre high boulders in places and they pile up. Mm. There are chalk features, but the boulders are more obvious. Yeah, and they're flint boulders as well. Flint boulders, yes. And it looks as though things are particularly rough here because things don't grow on the surface here like they do in other places. Somehow the hard back of the beach and perhaps a a surplus of smallish boulders and cobbles means that the whole place looks abraded. So if I stop sharing that one, and I'll share another one. Oh, hello. Um, yeah, so let's share some more. So <laughs> quiet little cooings. <laughs> I hope you're all right. <laughs> If you drop in at Chroma, very quickly you're on low stuff. Mm. So this is quite nice by Chroma run-in standards, sort of bit of shallow 
algae and then then on and in um but only on the peaks yes just on the very very tops of things yeah not not so much low down and very quickly you're into the cobbles and boulders and this stuff is i mean almost like well it's it's not a good cobbled street but the lower stuff almost interlocks it's a hard flinty layer on top of whatever's happening um, with a fair number of sort of small stones and it looks like that abrades things so here you get tough stuff not so much lush little algae not so many animals running around mm. it's pretty good for crustaceans but then mm. they're yeah. pretty tough and mobile yeah. it anyway. depends when you arrive yeah. but you're always struck by how processed it looks mm. it doesn't look gentle um, which doesn't mean it hasn't got nice animals in this is a nice <laughs> Um, long spine sea scorpion. Short spine. It's long. It looks, I think it's deformed because we're looking at it straight in the face. Okay. So that's a big spine mm. just there. That's an odd, odd angle. I nearly said short spined. We all know how to tell them apart, don't we, children? <laughs> okay. The long spine has a long spine, which you can't always see, and has a little white tag or barbel at the corner of its mouth. Um, Short spines have bigger faces, but this is taken with a fisheye lens, mm. so it's giving him sort of a shoe sized face and a, a small tail. And again, the rock he's on just has the lowest of low cover, sort of splashes of sort of barnacles, bryozo, and maybe, maybe a bit of sponge crust. Oh, I liked him. Mm. Mm. Um, sponges. It's, it's not bad for sponges, mm. and I think that's probably because with the algae being abraded, the sponges can establish. And this is a funny piece of shredded carrot, um, so-called because it looks carrotish. It's Ish. Amphilectus fucorum. <laughs> um, and it's the carrot, it's the sponges that add the colour to this site, not, not the algae really, mm. which is unusual. So there's a typical piece, and I mean, just look at it. Mm. It looks like a wasteland. Now you can see there's sort of low algae on the tops of these boulders, but around it, it's just sort of scoured. And this, it must be, at some point, it must be like being shot blasted. Yeah. So strange. Um, but interesting bits. So these are big flints, and these hollowed flints are the ones they call pot stones or paramudra. And there's a lot of those. Now these have been freed from the chalk. But Cromer used to be further out to sea, that the town has retreated. It used to be called Shipton, and it retreated to Cromere, which became Cromer. And so I kind of wonder whether a lot of this stuff has already sort of been maybe sort of foundation or works or, or something, or maybe was damaged when the, the, sort of the, the cliffs came down and the, the last town was lost. Next, getting further out, it starts to bush up, but not evenly, and you can see growth on the highest parts. Mm. Nice splatterings of sponge, more pot stones. Yeah, you're actually already quite deep there. Yeah, and again, these in scoured channels. Mm. And here's that sort of cobbly stuff that's locked together. And that is locked together and covered in pink encrusting algae like paint. So you can tell this stuff is flints. And that stuff is chalk. Mm. And there are channels between them. So this stuff is locked down. That stuff is permanent. But there's a lot of aggregate movement here. And we sort of click through. Oh, more That's of that. Um, <clears throat> no, do see animals about. And certainly the, the chroma fleet mm. is one of the biggest. But I don't think they actually fish very close in. I think they do the other end when you come to that but not at this end mm. yes yeah, so i think this means they'd have to go round the pier and they're far too sort of, sort of mean to travel round there but i wonder whether this was a very vigorous area of of shore fishing mm. there was a maybe a west side and east side fishery and now there's only an east of the pier side fishery but still there's I mean, got to be sort of I mean, 20 small boats they really mm. line up there although you you only ever really see one going in and out. It's John Davis's boat. Um, so, so there's some nice lobsters and, and crabs about on the chalk. 
they like the <clears throat> the alcoves, nooks and crannies. But again, they're lining up beside Flint. If this was Sheringham, they'd be hanging around big pieces of chalk, and mm. those are huge flints. Mm. So again, maybe it's something to do with the geology here that's led to that. We'll cut away there before that crab gets its comeuppance. But to be honest, I think the lobsters need to eat so rarely, you, you rarely see them even bother if they walk over a crab. <clears throat> there are a decent number of them about. The only fish you tend to see there, I suppose there's a couple of kinds, you'd see two spotted gobies and some wrasse, and this is a cork wing wrasse. There's a few of those about, but again, nothing like you'd see at Sheringham. I say this now knowing that at the end you're going to see some really nice fish and hopefully be pleased. Uh, so again, this is getting more Sheringham-ish, but it's still on flint, it's not on chalk. Mm. So it's, and it never changes, does it? As you swim mm. out, it just alternates bands of chalk and big piles of flints. Mm. It never becomes mm. like a coherent kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, Sheringham gets dark only when you get out onto its the boulderish plain, mm. its planar parts. And that's a good 400 metres. But here it starts with this sort of quite rough, bouldery stuff and works chalk and just keeps going. Oh, it's coming right for us. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a left-handed lobster. Oh, well, that's good tubey bits. Yeah, I mean, it makes it obvious that these are pieces of naturally formed flint. Um, <clears throat> you can see why they're called pot stones. Um, and the theory is they formed around burrows in the chalk. Dubious. Yeah, everybody's dubious about that. But whether they formed around something that formed a burrow, then diffused through it to form a surround to a burrow, nobody knows. And the, the scientific name for these, paramudra, is a complete fabrication because it's made up from the name of a worm that people wonder whether might have formed the holes. But they don't, they don't know. There's no cause and effect. There's just, just theories. No, oh, there he is again. We started again. Oh, we have, haven't we? Oh, no. Oh, he's so popular. Oh, I know what I haven't done. Mm -hmm. Haven't put them in date order. I think I haven't played these from the selected selection. <laughs> oh, you're going through the whole thing. <laughs> going through the whole damn thing. Um, anyway, let, let's, let's just quickly pop out. Mm -hmm. Am I doing this? No. No. No, this should be bearable. I do apologise. Let's have a quick look. Oh, no. Yes, it's... This will be something you can cope with. Yeah, so there's a bit of chalk going on. That's the same bit from the start again. Yeah, I think we yeah we have done them all. Sorry. Okay. So that that's a bit of chroma, and I've got another nice bit to show you because I'm hoping to find some rather pieces. So that was one trip over to the west side, and we've been a few times. And enough to know that this is characteristic of the site. That it's not a beautiful site, but it is a very interesting place. And so there's things like prawns, so crustaceans down there. Um, this is perhaps a brighter day, mm. so it's sort of colourful, but still things grow on top. The ground plane is really processed. I mean, look how clean that gravel is. Mm. It's as though it's been rolled, it's been washed. Yeah, that's Dawn, Dawn's right. Dawn can see a bellamite, a bullet shaped Ooh. piece of flint. So there, it's just like diving, just like the real thing. <laughs> um, there are pots if you get far enough out. Um, there's also a dirty great anchor, which I couldn't find pictures of because I think on the dive where I saw it, I had the wrong camera. So I'm pretty sure I've got pictures of the end of it, but they don't look like anything in thumbnails, so I couldn't find them. So there's a fair amount of potting goes on. But when we talk to the fisheries people about potting, we said that there are places where, I mean, much as we might like to see sort of better blanket controls of potting, some of the sites won't take damage like others. Um, and it looks as though chroma has either already been damaged or is not as susceptible because it doesn't have the sort of standing pieces of chalk and the soft features, it has more hard features. And here this pot 
is on top of that sort of bound cobbled flint and if they pulled it up you really wouldn't be able to tell it was had been there and there would be some light scuffing but not the big white flashes of broken chalk that you'd you'd see off Sheringham. Got more more pot zones even closer up nice picturesque flint so you can see there's a, a hardened scour underneath but growth up above away from the the scouring plane so well worth a dive here's more of those sort of pink locked cobbles um, in these you might actually be able to shift but in some places you can't move the individual pieces mm. they're actually sort of bonded in nice little lobster some nice bib hiding under a rock and so this is a quite an undercut piece of well it's a piled piece of flint mm. and again at Sheringham you'd have undercut flint with big pockets whereas here you people are mm. people fish uh, <laughs> clustering together waiting for a bus and a bits of flint <clears throat> yeah, so there, there's a bit of chalk but it, it's sort of nip and tuck as to whether this is I mean, this is a flint site more than a, a chalk mm. site occasionally you find big rises of chalk but they're not as significant i think i might have some oscarella in this selection do you think i do <laughs> <clears throat> so we've sort of well dawn has discovered a purple sponge up in north norfolk that is so far unique to north norfolk this one isn't unique it's the other purple sponge um, this is called Oscarella and the thing that makes it most unusual is not just its colour but that it, it's wobbly. Mm. If it has, I was... It has no glass skeleton. Yeah, no glass skeleton and so it's soft. Um, it's almost like berries. You know, it looks sort of black currantty raspberry-ish and if you wave your hand next to it it'll wobble. <laughs> Um, looks delicious. I haven't tried it. Mm. Probably not worth trying it. Um, not having glass spikes in as a defence probably means it's toxic. Almost certainly. Um, because most sponges are are too lazy to have a, a defence where they get up and travel away. They don't move significantly at all. But most of them either have glass spikes in, which makes them hard to eat, or some kind of toxin. And so since this doesn't have spikes in, I'd vote for toxins. There's a nice looking piece of scenery with a nice little lobster. Again, flint, all flint. And I think I was showing there, you can see this is a pot stone. You can see the green through to the other side. And you can see the green under that. So these are big slabs of chalk. So something happened here. That single two spot go be nipping up over the top. Mm hmm. Oh, it's the Tom Pop Lenny. <laughs> Oh yes, mm. sorry. I'll show you better mm. pictures because I had a wide angle lens on. <laughs> so although we saw a Tom Pop Blenny, um, I was more excited by these. And these. <laughs> and those. Um, and th they're big, but they, they decided not to stripe at all. Mm. Um, but they looked healthy, they weren't particularly big. Which I was gonna say, were they big ones? They're not particularly big. They're sort of- well, They uh, definitely are big, aren't they? Not yeah. Oh, cool cod. Yeah, so if you go and dive up in Scotland, you'll see probably twice as many types of stripy fish. So down here, you can see this one's got slight striping. So this is a bib or a poor cod. They differ in the way their fins line up. So I think on the bib, this lower fin comes sort of forward along with the, the first dorsal fin but equally they their eye is in proportion poor cod always look a bit thick and sick yeah they're always a bit wasted in comparison to this yeah they've got a big eye <laughs> which makes their body look thin and so they look a bit sickly whereas bib normally look all shiny and healthy and nice um, probably because people don't eat them by choice mm. um, they don't taste very nice oh god it's getting worse there's more of them oh Tom Pop Lenny. Oh, this is no good. I'm going to have to take pictures of something else, but I'll show you the Tom Pop Lenny. <laughs> so I was carrying a spare camera. That's a flashy thing to do. So all very nice things. As I came back, came back into a band of algae, but then out of it again pretty quickly. 
um, it was so this year, I think this was 2016, there was quite a lot of sand in shore. So there's just a, a few bits of algae off the top of those. Not again, not the big meadows you get at Sheringham coming up through the sand. Just little bits. And that, that's roughly where we were. So you can see this is all quite consistent with what we've been saying. It's not a not a put-up job. Um, very close to the pier, but over on the west. There's no boats on this side at all, are there? No. Um, so it's the safer side. Because the beach is entirely covered at high tide, isn't mm. it? Yes, the beach hut's up above. That's the walk back. You can see the white steps there. They look even more pleasant from here. And th most of these di dives from the white steps are out from the, that first groin, if you needed a point of reference. I'll show you a a uh, plotted outline of some of the, the site in a moment. Oh, there again. And a moment. Oh, I was hoping to see Dawn. There's Dawn looking cheerful, having done a GPS plot. Well done, Dawn. Oops. Okay, like I said, I did have another camera with me, so mm -hmm. would be remiss of me not to show a, a Tom Pop Blenny picture. Oops. Just trying to control my zoom to toolbars, which are in the way all the time. So that's a nice little Blenny. And I mean, for Penny, I think this is taken with a TG, which I had in my pocket. Um, and I think all it was, it was a nice bright day. The Blenny stayed nice and still. Um, and I was just able to shoot him in the face any sort of impression that there's nice separation is because he's very close and the back is far away. So even though this is just taken with a compact, it still looks like someone's taken care over these pictures. Whereas really I was just frantically trying to get the camera to focus on his eye and taking lots of pictures. Was that with its own flash? Yes. Yeah, it's just nice and close with its own flash. I was just going to say, and you can see he's got that big blue spot on his dorsal fin, which means he's a this year's baby. And this was just before the beast from the east, wasn't it? Yes. Just before that winter. So there were hundreds of these, but none of them survived that cold, hard winter. We didn't get any through to the next year. We didn't see them. So I, when, I, when I went up to see what was dead on the beach, I didn't see any of these. You wouldn't expect it, you only saw one a dive, really. Yes, but I saw hundreds of other things. I saw quite a lot of ballonrass, um, a few dogfish, quite a lot of dahlia anemones, um, lots of things that look like rockling, hundreds and hundreds of things that look like rockling um, that we really don't see on dives at all. Um, so it, it could be that lots were killed and they, they weren't very big because that, that year, 16, we did see lots of these, some on almost every dive. It was really lovely. Um, but equally, it might be that they're like velvet crabs. The, the velvet crabs retreat. They don't like cold. And they might have, they might go. So the summer weather might pump them, or the winter, the, in, the arrival of winter might push them further out and might have meant they didn't get caught, but they, they stayed there. Um, because we've had the velvet crabs took five years to come back mm. after the hard winter in about 13 or so. Who knows, lovely little fish. I was very pleased to see him. Um, and so this really was just luck, Penny. He just sort of swam over and was displaying on a rock Sickening, isn't it? <laughs> there we're going round again. Round. Oh well, sorry, that was just showing off. So, what was that? So that's a TG three. I'd fully zoomed in. Um, so ISO two hundred. So it's not gone up too high. I think I'd probably set it to do that. And what else can we tell you? Uh, I'd done manual white balance instead of its automatic underwater and that's probably not made it better to look at initially but I will have um, done um, just sort of it'll be easy to color balance because of the white chalk so it's probably just 
make it more contrasty and turn the color up. Um, the main thing is that it's sharp. Now, if it's sharp, you can spend a long time knocking about. But because it's only my spare camera, it doesn't travel with a big flash on it. Um, although arguably I could have piped the big flash from my other camera to it because they both work the same way. I didn't because I was desperate to catch him while he was there. Excellent. So let's have a quick look at something else. And I will show you where I was. Uh, da -da -da -da. What the tracks? No, not that. Yeah, sorry. Excellent. So this is an overview of the site, and I just is oddly a screen grab rather than an actual plot. Um, this shows the zigzag path and looks as though we'd come from a building in, in downtown Cromer, which isn't the case. Must have been a GPS error. Um, and this is probably a swim about 400 meters out. Mm. It's a bit longer than the pier. Um, so by that kind of time, you're in seven or eight meters. Yeah, it never really gets much deeper, does it? I think it gets, I think it's deeper over here. Yes, it does. It's definitely deeper on that side because you've been out not as far mm. and got deeper, haven't you? Yeah, so I think Ten at most, okay. that, kind, that kind of depth. So I think shallower over in this area, sort of straight out from the steps or the path. Uh, the, the red one straight in and out is Dawn. Um, I th Dawn says that this purple track is when she let Chris navigate. And then she came back. Um, which I think didn't work out well because it meant you got a long swim and a long walk back. Um, this weird palsied orange one I think is one of mine and I reckon the anchor is somewhere here mm. if anyone was wanting to have a look. I think it's a kind of a setting off northeast-ish and although I'm sure I've got a track for it I don't know where that is. It's probably around somewhere. So this is an interesting area, deepens slightly faster, but I think I backed off because I didn't want to swim around the pier. No, you don't want to attract the lifeboat. No, uh, the, the lifeboat launches off the end of the pier and there's a buoyed area to be maintained clear. Um, I'm not sure it would bother you really, but the, the lifeboat does come down a dirty great slope. <laughs> So best to stay clear and then nobody has to argue about it at all. We have been constantly told, because I've constantly asked, hey, what about letting us just park down there? Because there's car parking, but it's disabled spaces. I said, well, I mean, what if one of us did? What, and ferried the stuff up and down. But so far, no action on that. But they've said, you could actually, if you wanted to, drive down. So I think for a few years, while they were reworking the Western Promenade, you couldn't drive down. Um, but now it's open again, so you can drive down. At the bottom of the steps, there's a space you could drop gear and a person and work and set up quite safely. And then you could pop back and some poor sod could try to find a parking space. And that's one way to do it. So that's the Western Promenade. Um, very interesting. You can see there's interesting animals, interesting fish if you catch them at the right time. Um, but the pier is probably a more obvious place to dive. Um, so if we go back to the bathymetry and move that into the center, the pier is a more obvious place to dive, but if anything, the access is even worse. Um, you can actually drive down the front by the fisherman's slip, which is about here, I think, along the front to the pier, and or along, back and round and up again. Um, all the parking down here is set aside for permitted residents, and up on the slipway is aggressively defended by fishermen. So you're kind of back to the same kind of performance again. I think when we did it, we parked up on the front as we would for the Western Promenade. And a brazen friend of ours just went and parked by the pier. 
it was sickening. He did say he was disabled. He did say he was disabled and he did look disabled. <laughs> Although I think at the time it was arguable. He was very sick looking. And so he, he got to park. That was, that was good. Um, so diving round the pier is kind of, a, it's not quite a mini Swanage experience, is it? It's, the pier is in very, very shallow water. So you'd want to dive it at high tide, otherwise you'd be waist deep um, for most of the length of the pier. Um, which is not to say there's nothing under there, just that it, it is very shallow. Mm. Um, the tidal range here is about four metres, roughly speaking. The tidal range at Swanage can't be much more than two. No, it hardly moves, does it? Um, so Swanage always stays diveable, whereas this um, becomes a walk at a, a lowish tide and a, a pretty sandy one at that. Um, after this we'll talk about Happy Valley um, but let's have a chat about the pier and to do that I'll share an album, another album of some pier pictures and we can have a look at that. I'll just pick out the right one, there we go. Oh the pier, is that the pier? No that's not the pier. Oh, there's the pier. Sorry, here we have a pier. Um, shift, shift my toolbars around again. Uh, so this is our friend Dave, Dave Thistlethwaite, um, waiting to go in. And this is high-ish tide, and we were going to hop in on the same slack as everywhere else. And it was, it was, it was fine when we went in. We weren't, didn't have any difficulty. You can see how close to the surface it is because you can see pilings sticking out. Um, everybody bravely set off. I think that might, no, I'm not sure who that, that's Dave, isn't yeah. it? Setting off on his own somewhere, weirdly. Random. Um, I think this is Sam and... Me. And you, and maybe that one is Barry? No, it's Sam's before. Oh yeah, sorry, Tony. Next, so everybody's going for a walk off under the pier, and under it, it was really very nice, wasn't it? It's nice, bright, sandy, um, and not much on it in the shallows because it often dries. As you went a bit further under or down, starting to see racks because this is stuff that does dry, it's seaweed that can stand a bit of drying. Um, but interesting, so we're probably about halfway along there, and maybe we've got two and a half, maybe three meters. Mm. All look very, very photogenic. Uh, it's Sam doing her best photogenic swimming. Um, and still, I think that's just rack. Mm. Um, but I can't, can't complain her taking pictures of it because I'd just taken some pictures of it. So we're, we're being good sea searchers and recording what we see. Rack, more rack. <laughs> Nice rack. Lots of stuff on the structure of the pier. Um, this is big, easy to spot stuff, but there's plenty of sort of crab line, angling line, and almost everything that's ever happened on the pier has then been chucked in. Um, the pilings, the pier is metal and is set in concrete. Um, I'm guessing that's probably not original. I think this is probably a reinforcement of, of a structure and it probably did go steel into the ground and then they concreted it to to reinforce it rather than having to rebuild the thing. And more stuff and Dawn diving around, picturesque views, look at that. So it's easier to keep track of than Swanage because in Swanage when you have low visibility you can you can get lost in the, the pilings and the pilings aren't all completely logical. There's, there's quite a scattering of pilings and the pier is a funny shape. Whereas here, you can go along um, the, the sections of the pier um, with easy handrails. It's ideal for the infirm. Nice sunbursts. Um, this is fishing leftovers and a piece of a pot and a sort of a, a crab bag. Was that a, maybe a keep, keep net? net. That an angle has dropped. Now, further in, things start to settle down. The pilings have sort of risen up above the seabed a bit, 
and you start to get onto a bit of seabed that has some structure to it. And an angry crab. There's an angry crab. Oh. Um, another sea scorpion. Ah, and a crab. Dawn caught a crab. So this looks like it's a, a child's beanbag crab. And you see how surprised he is that Dawn has spotted a crab she didn't instantly identify. Um, there's lots of building materials underneath. So I think this is a, actually a bit of sort of slab of bedrock exposed, perhaps graded chalk that had been worked over while they've been putting the, the pier in and maybe smoothed later on. But there's lots of other building pieces, sort of odd bits of metal, string bags. I think this looked like it was probably a sandbag full of metal parts. Mm. So maybe a bag of scaffolding fixings. There really was loads of old rubbish. Um, nice selection of beadlet and anemones on that rock. A bit of scaffolding. The pilings further out starting to be undercut. Maybe I should have told someone. More rubbish, and it's a crab line, or oh, I suppose it could, it could be a kite, but it's a crab reel, mm. isn't it? Right. Lots and lots of lines, so well worth being careful. Sand eels. I think these are sand eels just scooting across the surface, and they're sort of swishing in. Then scaffolding poles and lots of crab waste. They look like they look like somebody went to the pier to chuck their rubbish in. Yes. There's lots and lots of that. I don't know if there's two attempts to reinforce the pier or just a, a cool way of making the ones further out a bit taller, perhaps cased and cased again to make them a bit more sturdy. More crab waste, crab waste. Um, big piece of conglomerate covered in beadlet anemones. <clears throat> so it's a strange little bit of reef. So all the coloured dots are beadlet anemones, which makes it look weirdly like a pile, a pile of skulls. <clears throat> But it wasn't a pile of skulls. Bit of a pot, more scaffolding, keep net, planks, um, battery. battery, more fishing and building waste. Um, but that's not to say it's all just unrelenting rubbish, which is a lot of it really. Um, the pilings are interesting and we saw some kinds of sponge here that we haven't seen anywhere else. Some little stalked sponges up on these concrete pilings. So presumably this was simulating a rocky reef um, in a reasonable amount of sort of clean current. It's probably simulating depth as well because it was dark, wasn't it? You know, so a bit, a bit of that. I mean, sometimes species rely on a bit of dark and not because necessarily they like dark, but it suppresses algae. Like the, the offshore site, the algae was suppressed by abrasion, but that doesn't necessarily mean that anything but the toughest other animals can turn up. Um, where the algae is suppressed here by being shaded under the pier for a while, you might get other things come in. And in this case, it was a tiny sponge, which again, I don't have a picture of because I was doing wide angle. So sorry about that didn't have the right kind of thing. This is an interesting gro growth pattern of sponge. Oh yeah, I'm going to sleep. This really is dull. Sorry. <clears throat> and some hydroids. So, good for shots, I think. It's a shore crab having a, a look. Towards the end of the pier, the bits of steely structures get more interesting and exotic. And weirdly, it looks like um, beyond these concrete things, the thing is more sort of steel and there's sort of remnant parts of pipe. I don't mm, know. Like a water pipe. Isn't like it? a water pipe. I mean, kind of suspicious, really. Wondering whether the end of the pier show once had its own sort of special water supply <laughs> and or sewage treatment. So here's a slightly sort of cobbly piece of, I think this is flint, mm. sort of ribbled and worn, more structure. And I think we'd probably got underneath or towards the lifeboat house. And we decided to turn to avoid it. Yeah, well, it was. we looked around, but we decided not to go much further. It was definitely a, a newer area of disturbance. Mm. So it was sort of laid bare somewhat. Um, quite exciting, mm. an undercut piece of piling. Maybe we should have said something. 
that's years ago and it's still standing up it's bound to be fine um <clears throat> Uh, oh yes, here's one of these weird pieces of pipe, and it almost seemed to be crossing the pier, mm. as though there was a, a a coastline support. But perhaps, I mean, in the old days, um, lots of places had piers so that coastal steamers could pick people up, and it might have been that as they were steamers, they needed a big water supply. Mm. So perhaps this is that could be a thing. Mm. Look at that, we're doing history. So it could have been something like a big water supply out to supply uh, steamers. I don't think they do much anymore. As you can see, it's not in prime condition, so it's certainly not used for a very long time, but quite ornate, the support it's got. Yeah, so I had a quick look at that and decided that after that, the area sort of opened up a bit more and we, we turned back. So plumos and anemones there, so no abrasion at that point. They're quite sensitive to abrasion. Yeah, we really should go and have another look, shouldn't we? Now we know more about sponges and things. Mm. Yeah, so maybe the, the pier needs to get read. Oh, look at that. Mm. You could, I could crop it better and you could assume you were visiting the Sillies. They'd get ever so jealous about that. Last time I went to the Sillies, I saw a really boring cable and they were thrilled because it was a bit of wreckage. <laughs> it was very funny. Thought, this is awful. But they were very excited by it because it was wreckage. Do you think that's another anchor? Yeah, another has, anchor. It has the look of an anchor about it. A weird piece of stuff. The dawn pleased that we're going back and it all got a bit creepy towards the end and that all the building supplies get you down as you travel back <clears throat> yeah, it was a, quite a quite a nice dive quite interesting it was mm. just the, the, the hassle of getting in and out i think now that we've done the western promenade and we know that we could deliver stuff down there perhaps that's that's the way to do it we mm. do a circuit to drop gear and one person off and then someone else parks There you go. So, yes, I mean, you might say, oh, well, actually, it's quite bright, but it's, you've seen a lot of pictures with light in the background of them, whereas sort of this sort of structure overhead cuts the light out for a lot of the day. So as far as sort of productive light for algae goes, um, well, things will only get the light, say, up until mid-morning under the pier, then it goes darker during the day. And they don't get peak direct light um, for more than a fraction of the day. It certainly sort of mitigates their, their production, calms them down. Well done. Okay, so that was the pier. I mean, not, not a bad dive, but, but fiddly. Um, when they talked to me about how they should do the pier for um, the, the mo not the mosaic, the muriel, for the muriel they did, on the Western Promenade, um, they were part concerned about whether they sh should portray a diver at all. Because it might encourage people. Because it might encourage people. And I said we should portray a diver diving sensibly and perhaps portray the risks as well so that the mural was actually a useful guide to diving rather than an idyllic sort of invitation to do it. And I think in the end, they put in something like a galleon or something. So <laughs> it did make it look better um, than it actually was. But you can't help some people. OK, so oops, back to the bathymetry. Let's have a look at the bathymetry. And you'll see that sort of things didn't really get super weird until you're off the end of the pier. So the pier isn't a dive you really do for geology. But actually, it is quite interesting. And although this area to the west is more uniform, when you come over to the right, things start to get quite freaky. Um, the big black bits are just gaps in the bathymetry, presumably because the, the crew had to have tea or something broke. Um, but over here, you can see um, we've got some biggish ridges which would bear examination. Um, a bit of a sort of a dome coming out around the the fishing boats coming down from the fishing slip, so that would keep it it's shallow. Probably an enormous pile of crab shells. <laughs> it, it could be an enormous pile of crab <laughs> shells or skillfully knitted jumpers. Mm. That's what fishermen are often wearing. Um, and it's 
part of the start of this deep channel which goes over to the east towards Overstrand. And we, we talked about Overstrand being a weird place with odd offshore currents. And as you can see, this is the start of that sort of snaking deep channel which heads over to there. And this may be why so dives over on this side of town had problems with their timing. Um, so the third place that we've dived is called Happy Valley. Um, why is it called Happy Valley, Dawn? Because that's the name of the park at the top of the cliffs. Mm. So presumably it's probably a seasidey cheerful thing, isn't it? Why not come to Happy Valley? <laughs> and be unhappy. Yeah. Um, and so we have not dived straight out from this eastern side of the pier. Because that's uh, suicide. Well, that appears to be fraught with difficulty because this is where all the fishermen launch from. And you've not only got the actual hazard of the boats, you've got the potential sort of hostility from the fishermen. Um, your mileage may vary. It just doesn't seem worthwhile. Although there's some interesting features out here. Mm. Um, so last year we had a walk around up on the cliffs and thought, where else can we get down? Because we're always looking to get down. We're very good, Mick. Um, and we walked up from this cute little park. There's a fun tea room in this cute little park. They do cakes and stuff. That's quite fun. Um, I think there are some lavatories down there. Always worth noting for a diver, there's some lavatories. And we walked up and found some steps. Um, this is cutting the story short, because we did walk miles over here as well and find no steps. Mm. Or so, well, there's, Is there another step? There's a set of 150 steps further along. Yes, they're way, way <laughs> you further You really along. don't want to go there. It's a horrible walk. <laughs> Um, I mean, really is it's somewhere over here, isn't it? It's about halfway between there and Overstrand. Yes, it's just miles. So we decided that, that was more effort, more excitement than we needed. Mm -hmm. And when we decided to dive, we thought that this set of steps looked accessible. And in looking at the map, we realised that actually you can park pretty close. Um, so. Whether this area of town is called Happy Valley itself, I don't know. I think it's more, this road is called the Warren. Yes, this is Happy Valley, this green bit. Okay, so there are, there's Happy Valley. And you can walk along to the Warren. There's a little lane and you just pop out here. Um, the guy who lives here was very, very twitchy about having a huge minibus with blackened windows <laughs> parked outside which probably means he's got a vast crop of cannabis growing. <laughs> um, but I had a chat with him and, and apologised awfully and said, well, that was the problem, wasn't it? If you lived on a road, that people could park on the road. And really, that was fair. And he said, well, I can't get out of my gate. And I said, I was more than happy to move so he could get in out of his gate, so I moved. Um, and that seemed to completely diffuse his whole thing. Um, but the people in here are, I guess, cloistered, because this is a very quiet area of town. Um, but other people do know you can park there and it does fill up. It fills up after about nine o'clock with people going to mm. the beach. Yeah. It's one of the nicest places, though, to change and get ready, because all the houses, being nice houses, are big, tall hedges. Mm. Um, so you're pretty much on your own. It's quite classy as a dive place goes. Um, yeah, so that was a good piece of parking. Pop down. And this is 110 steps? Yes, it's 110 exactly again. Um, and it brings you down between these beach huts. Uh, there's a little sort of, no, you can't really see it. There's a little flat bit and you can see the steps. And you need to be careful um, because... The next way you can get up is the fisherman's slip over here or that other big walk of steps way way over to the east. So this is a dive where you want to have sort of good control of your heading and make sure you come back 
Oh, obviously that's a good thing. Mm. Um, Dawn had a good dive here and got out pretty deep and pretty exciting. Tell us about your dive, Dawn. Well, <laughs> I think I got to about 12 or 15 metres, probably in that blue bit. Um, but it's quite interesting. Again, it, inshore, it's quite scrubby, strange flints, but the flints are built up almost like dry stone walls. They're in regular lines, two or three boulders high as you first go out. And then you pass some odd wreckage, sort of big square lumps. And then you come to some very big chalk features, which are unfortunately beaten to death by potting. So there's not a lot of life on the tops. They're sort of big rolling hills of chalk, but the, the top sections are <coughs> utterly bare where the, the pots have just beaten them down. And there's an awful lot of lines of pots, so you wouldn't do it with a, an SMB because you'd get all tied up. Mm. So do you think you went sort of straight out? You know me. Mm. Now Dawn is famous for going straight out and straight back. So you probably actually went north, south. Yes, Michael went north, north, west, I think. And he got a slightly different experience. Yeah, so you're probably heading over in, into this kind of area. Mm. Yeah, I started <clears throat> quite close to the groin, so mm. I would have gone into that quite deep bit. Yeah, it looks as though here, sort of northeast would be interesting pretty exciting so yeah sort of north northeast or northeast itself and that's weird because that's normally where michael goes yes i don't know why he didn't <laughs> i think he was playing safe because he didn't want to get <clears throat> dragged down mm. it's all pretty arbitrary and i think if you're diving a new site you want to to play safe mm -hmm. so people will have known that after high tide because we probably did this on a high tide um the tide would bring us back to the west and so that would be the safe choice because nobody wanted to be carried over to the east and have a, a big walk back. The beach isn't bad for walking, is it? No, it's, a it's reasonable, quite flat. A yeah, reasonable walking beach. And I think you can get through most of these groins. Which Certainly at low tide you can. Yeah, I think you can get behind them. Mm -hmm. And there's some places where you can't get behind the groins and it's, it's a bit like hard work. Um, so you may be saying to yourselves, why aren't there marvellous pictures of this site? Um, Dawn has pictures, but they're just close-ups of, of little animals. We thought that's n not so descriptive of things as Dawn does sort of close-up pictures and I, I do a variety. Um, I've dived here and I had uh, pretty much sort of the wrong dive. I went in um, slack was very, very late. I went in with uh, somebody who wasn't super experienced um, and we basically just crabbed out sideways against a heavy current going to the east, so before slack, um, for half an hour. Because that was hard work, um, the person I was diving with got quite low on air and maybe we got 250 meters. So we didn't get super deep. We just got to an area which was starting to be interesting, small boulders, and because of a lack of air, it was time to come back. So we took a couple of pictures and then came back and never really saw anything of striking interest at all in that, that band. Mm. And the, the, the current didn't really allow us to look around. So again, this is some, this is an area we'll explore more and it looks like it really does have potential. If you went for a, a big old swim, those pits certainly would be very interesting. Yes, yeah, so I think I just got into those and thinking about it, I think I did get to 15 and that's where the, the life really started being interesting, mm. but I had to come back. Oh, how typical. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> anyway, that's a bit of chroma. Um, there's lots of other stuff out here. There's a wreck called the Teddington that's only about two miles off. Um, various other bits of hardware if you drift past. And the, the chalk is nice for drift if you're out with a boat. Um, so it's, it's a good, a good centre for a bit of diving, um, but not always the, the easiest place to get a dive because that end of the reef, like um, Overstrand, um, does seem to be a bit finicky tide-wise. Definitely definitely hard work. Oh, there you go. So anybody, anybody got any questions? Any, any ideas? Is the, um, it is the flint uh, sharp at all? Not usually. 
Um, Only if it's been shattered, which it does sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of the flint, I mean, it's not consciously napped or... Yeah. yeah. Um, where big bits have flown around, sometimes you'll find some of those pot stones, which are the size of a dustbin or at least waste paper basket, can be shattered through. And they're, they can be sort of sharpish edged, but nobody's brought them to a razor edge. And most mm -hmm. of it is just smooth, lumpy and encrusted. Okay. Mm. Okay. Mm. Yes. Have has anybody else died there? You have you, you haven't been there, have you, Penny? No, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> no. <laughs> After all of that. <laughs> Very intriguing. It must be a um, a must for this year. Mm. Oh, I'm not sure you can make it, Chris. Could, uh, persuade um, a rib boat to get out to those deeper pits. That certainly would be um, interesting. Oh, you're. So, I mean, aren't aren't you just looking for a way of burning off your your lockdown? Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Love handles. Yeah, <laughs> I think the the problem with working close in at Chroma is I think, I think if you can brazen it out, you'd be absolutely fine. I mean, we, we've done stuff past Chroma, but we've probably not come much more, much closer than say a mile off as we drifted past mm. and we didn't get any trouble at all. Mm. But I think those things are very close in. Even those pits are probably only about 500 meters out. Yeah, if you go in and go for it, you'd be fine. I was, I took too <clears> long looking at other things. I <clears> should have just gone straight out. Yeah, maybe it's another one we could kayak past and sort of go around uh, as a pair, have a, a kayak out, have somebody watching, watching over to make sure nothing, nothing weird happens. Because it sounds like that's a heavily plotted area as well. So it would be... In comparison mm -hmm. to the wood for distance, how would you feel? I'd say it's those pretty, darker areas. pretty similar to that, but you've got stuff to look at all the way. It's not open sand mm. like that is. Mm. Yeah. Okay. It's still, I mean, it's, all these things are unfortunately a bit of a, a bit of a trek. That band of bathymetry, bathymetry is about a kilometre wide. Uh, so if I do a measure over to one side, and you can see that so the dive we did on the pier, whoops, in, in good grief, I mean, the pier is only 150 metres long. Um, so, I mean, this sort of band of stuff, it's about... It's 500 uh, to the good stuff, isn't it? Really? Yeah, four, four or 500 to the good stuff. So you're looking at going beyond the wood at Cly, which is probably about 350. But then the, the mm. good gullies at Sheringham mm. are 600 to the, the ends, aren't they? No, I think they're probably only about 400, 450. You, you get to the ends. No, I th the problem is, I think it depends where you count your starting from. Um, because we can measure across this. There you are. Yeah, that's about a kilometre wide. But it's starting. It's starting what could amount to be 100 metres mm. Yeah. Uh, well, they are, if you were heading for one of these, that's not uh, yeah, four hundred quarter a mile. Yeah, the the further east you go, the closer they are. Eventually, you start to lose out. Yeah, but I think if we got the the slack time off pat, then that that wouldn't be too bad. And although it's a bit of an up and down, um, if you were heading deeper, it might be that if you stayed on for low tide and you got to understand the tides weren't mm. threatening that would bring the deeper stuff or it would make the deeper stuff shallower mm. and you'd be doing less of a swim uh, well i did it with michael we just added half an hour on and that was fine well, i know well, you're magical <laughs> <laughs> i mean i know there's some poor little soldiers who tried to dive over, over strand the same day you did and they were carried away <laughs> have you recovered chris <laughs> he's muted so he won't be uh, it was the day before, actually. Uh, Dawn had total slack. And me and Michael <laughs> got carried off to uh, Mundersley. Chris, we were there at the same time. <laughs> we, we we saw you. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, that day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was referring to the one that uh, Michael gave me a fright. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, to, and, and, and also, to be honest, it looks like you could dart around here into these around the two and three hundreds. That looks like quite regular chalk, doesn't it? Looks <coughs> like a look. Yeah, so I mean, this is definitely sort of pounded flat, mm. and then you're getting onto it looks like yeah. mounds of it before. Yeah, it looks the, like the east is definitely the way to go. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what the hell that was. Mm. That looks very, very odd. That looks tiring. Hmm. <coughs> Uh, but anyway so what's the parking is there any parking um you said there were some other steps where there was the tea room as well where that sort of little bell is um yeah so the, i think this is the effectively the, the town council offices um i'm not sure which one of these is the little maybe that's the little tea room that probably a tea room oh or, sorry no that's the, that's the rocket house that's the rocket it? house or something where you can get mm. tea and stuff um i think maybe it's in here but yeah this this slipway here is one you could walk down um equally i think there's another the steps here as well where you can get down um there isn't a big car park close to either of these so this is the fisherman's slip where i think you can i know what we might be able to talk to the people at merchant's place mm. we did talk about that we have we? talked about that so yeah. you can't park on cliff drive to walk down because it's residents only okay so all oh, right we yeah. looked at that last year mm. yes yeah I, I think it might take a bit of looking around there's, that there's a fair amount of parking was this banded that some of it was resident, some of it wasn't, but the bits that were close and accessible were? Yeah, so by the time you got to a bit that was all right, you were so far away, it wasn't worth it. Yeah, I think we sort of headed off and walked around. I think we'd had a day blown out or, mm. or miserable in we some way. We had a good walk around to see what was possible. Yeah. And you were pretty much down at this end of it, weren't you? And there's no way through there. Uh, no obvious way through. There are walks through. There's several passages through from this road to the front. There is, but then your steps are still back there or over there. Mm. Again, nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So not super convenient. And this sort of parking on the end there was the shortest run to those steps. Mm. Um, yeah yeah i think this one is prob probably uh, if you could park on the fisherman's slip it would probably be the best walk is that pay and display i'm i'm not sure mm. i think it's very vague mm. a lot of fishing stuff is vague mm. i'm half sure that you don't that it isn't that it is certainly free. anyone can park there can't they yeah. it's not private or anything i think it's kept very very poorly sort of described um yeah well, i suppose i mean as a just a straight line the big town car park whoops isn't actually that far if you didn't mind walking through town <laughs> <laughs> round, round to the front of the hotel de paris and down <laughs> would take you straight there well, i think it'll probably maybe the most civilized thing is to do a sort of team thing mm. where we sort of let people sort of do this as a circuit after parking somewhere and then one person makes sure everything else is packed away and back while their, their kit is looked after. But again, you did do it did it as a day, it would be all right. I think the pier would be a bit of a non-starter on low tide. Um, Happy Valley you could probably do on either. Um, the, the rocky bits over here you could do on either mm. yes <clears throat> yeah we've done that at both states of the tide haven't we mm, we have yeah so what do you think chris how many boats have you bought chris <laughs> 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 i think we've 
Uh, still in uh, progress, unfortunately. Ah, uh, oh well. I think that's probably probably enough for everyone. Um, if everybody's happy, um, we'll 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 wave goodbye and say thanks for coming along. Um, we'll have a think about what we do next week. Again, I think we might have a break because I think these have been nice. It's been nice proving they can happen. Um, my sort of feeling is because I, I've sort of decided not to do a camera one on the Friday because I thought that people were catching up with stuff and rather than sort of fight for people's time this was supposed to be sort of something nice to keep you entertained and stop you killing each other um, it certainly helped us um, <clears throat> so, so we'll, despite, we'll have, pardon? despite the haircuts despite the haircut that was part of the, part of the fight we had to cut ourselves free <laughs> Um, the hair had got so matted, we were Velcroed together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so probably we'll have more of a think about the next one because the idea was to eventually do a chat about every site. And certainly the, the damn Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, but certainly the big one we haven't done is sharing them. Mm. So I think we'd like to do that before the start of the, the dive year. Yeah. And so maybe we'll you know a bit more pre-warning on that um, to coordinate a bit. And we'll probably try and do at least one more um, wildlifey thing, maybe a couple. Um, again, maybe something like fish and maybe bryozoans and hydroids. So something nice. And then something we'd like you to learn that you don't want to learn as a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a sort of stick and carrot kind of thing. You don't get the nice one if you don't come to the, the, the difficult one. Let's see how you feel. Okay. Thanks everybody for coming along. Very nice to see you all yeah, again. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, thank Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye Will. Bye Chris. See you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye